All right, so I'm just going to get started. Hi, everyone. Welcome to tonight's live online author event with Greenlight Bookstore. I'm Shami from Greenlight, and we're thrilled to host tonight's event, An Evening with Object Lessons, a series of short, beautifully designed books about the hidden lives of ordinary things published by Bloomsbury. Tonight's authors both explore issues of identity and race through these everyday objects. Ayana Thompson will be presenting her book, Blackface, and Paddy Smedavi will be presenting her book, Hyphen. Uh, before we start, I just want to say a huge thank you to Ayana, Paradis, the team at Bloomsbury um, for making this happen, and thank you all for showing up. Although we're not able to host events in our stores, um, our community of authors and readers is still here, and we're really grateful for your support. Uh, a couple of housekeeping things in our Zoom webinar tonight, you can see and hear the speakers, but they can't see or hear you. Um, but there are a couple of ways that you can interact. There's the chat where you can talk with other attendees and with um, the speakers as well. And then you'll have a chance to have your questions answered um, in the Q&A model. So you can find that by clicking on the icon that looks like two speech bubbles at the bottom. And we'll be pulling questions only from the Q&A to be answered. So make sure you put them there. Uh, more importantly, tonight's featured books are available for sale from Greenlight Bookstore. You can shop in person from 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. or um, purchase online at our website, which is the link that I put in that I'll put in a couple of times as well. Um, if you care about supporting the careers of authors and ongoing existence of independent bookstores, buying tonight's featured book is a great way to show your support. Um, so tonight's authors are Ayana Thompson and Paddy Smedavi. Um, Ayana Thompson is a Regents Professor of English and Director of Arizona uh, of the Arizona Center for Medieval and Renaissance Studies at Arizona State University. She's the author, co-author, and editor of several books on Shakespeare, early modern theater, and race. Most recently, Shakespeare in the Theater, Peter Sellers. Uh, she, was in, she was the president of the Shakespeare Association of America, served as a member of the board of directors for the Association of Marshall Scholars, and is currently collaborating with Curtis Perry on the Arden Four edition of Titus Andronicus. Um, Paradis is the Dean of Social Sciences in this College of Liberal Arts and Sciences and a professor in the School of Social Transformation at Arizona State University. She's a nonfiction writer with 20 years of experience as an anthropologist, public health researcher, and expert in sexual politics across the globe. She's the author of five books, including her first on the sexual politics of modern Iran, pa Passionate Uprisings, Iran Sexual Revolution. Um, a former journalist and academic, she was written for Miss Magazine, Foreign Affairs, The Conversation, and several other publications. Ayana's new book, Blackface, explains what blackface is, why it occurred, and what its legacies are in the 21st century, connecting the first performances of blackness on English stages, the birth of blackface minstrelly, and contemporary performances of blackness and anti-black racism. Paradis's new book, Hyphen, follows the story of the hyphen from antiquity to the present, but also under, uh, uncovers the politics of the hyphen and the role it plays in creating identities. The journey of this humble piece of connected punctuation reveals the quiet power of an orthographic concept to speak to the travails of hyphenated individuals all over the world. Ayana and Paradis will start us off with readings from their books, and then they'll be talking with each other and then with all of you. Um, so I'll hand it over to Ayana. Thanks so much, Shani. And thanks everyone for attending. Thanks to Greenlight Books. Um, and to Bloomsbury for uh, being a great publisher. Um, it probably would have been more fun if I had read from Pardis's book. <laughs> we should have swapped. <laughs> so I'm just gonna read a little bit from the beginning of my book. When my son Dash was in the third grade from 2011 to 2012, he attended a private school that prided itself on its academic rigor. In fact, each eight-year-old student was required to do a year-long research project on an influential person in history. As the culmination of their research, the kids had to make a poster that highlighted their person's life and accomplishments 
and then dress up as their person and answer questions as if they were the person, the famous person during the poster presentation. It was a lot of work and the presentations were impressive. That year there were astronauts and entertainers, politicians and athletes, humanitarians and playwrights. And there were also several little white children in full on blackface makeup. They were Martin Luther King Jr., Serena Williams, and Arthur Ashe. As I walked around the room, looking at the posters and interacting with the famous historical people, I was stunned when I saw the first blacked up child. Attempting to keep my face neutral, I asked questions about Martin Luther King's life and praised the student for her hard work. It was clear that she, was, that she had immense respect and reverence for Dr. King. He was her hero. She beamed through her blacked up face, proud to be him. I stared on in an attempt not to register my horror and dismay. After taking this in, I immediately went to find the school's principal to ask what was happening. Was makeup allowed, encouraged? Did the teachers facilitate this? Were the parents involved? What conversations had they had about cross-racial impersonation, even if this all occurred under the auspices of hero worship? The principal seemed not to understand what I was saying, that the children's performances were veering dangerously close to blackface. He seemed confused and indicated that he thought I was making a tempest in a teapot. I could see in his eyes that he was reading me as an irrationally angry black woman. And then he asked, what is blackface minstrelsy anyway? I was gobsmacked by the question. In fact, I was quickly becoming the angry black woman he thought I was, wondering why I should have to explain American history to an American educator in a Tony private school. Why didn't he know this already? Why was it my job to teach him our shared history? Why did I have to pay this black tax on top of the tuition I was already paying? I was enraged by his ignorance because it made starkly visible the inequality of our experiences. I had to know this history because it affects me and my children in the 21st century. He did not because of his white privilege, which was expressed through an implicit notion that this history did not, does not, and will not impact him or the white charges in his private school. When my anger was less blinding and began to subside, I was a rationally angry black woman after all. I recognized that the principal's ignorance was symptomatic of the American amnesia with regard to racism and racial violence. The history is difficult and the solutions are neither readily apparent nor easily achievable. So forgetting, while not necessarily natural, is widespread, per pervasive, and common. And forgetting blackface minstrelsy, a performance tradition from the early 19th century, is easy to accomplish because it happened back then. The principal's reaction, while unfair, was actually normal. But I am not content with this normal state of being. I need to be able to make it as impossible for him to forget as it is for me. It is both of our history after all. I need to be able to combat the extensive drift towards amnesia. This book is my attempt. This book is a defiant and material act of remembering our collective American history. This book is for every parent, teacher, friend, or colleague who has had to face and address similar questions about the uses, problems, and issues with blackface. In order to explain why, what blackface is, why it occurred, and what its legacies are in the 21st century, I will ask repeatedly while, why the handful of black and brown children in my son's third grade class did not attempt to whiten up to be William Shakespeare, Sir Isaac Newton, and the other white heroes. Not one of the children of color in my son's class applied racial prosthetics to look white. Why not? 
Were they less committed to the fidelity of their representations? Did they know something the white children did not? Or did the white children know something the black and brown children did not? These questions haunt this book and fuel my writing of it. Thank you. Pardis, you get to take it away. <laughs> kind of a tough act to follow. Thank you so much for that reading, but also for your book, which I absolutely love. By no other book this year by Ayana's book. Uh, so for sure, get get clicking on that right right now. It's it's an incredibly powerful and yet really you know easy to read book um, in in the sense that it's a really hard subject. But Ayana's elegant writing, it you, you just got a taste of. Um, makes it all sit with you in a way where you can start to digest it. So that's what I really appreciate about that book. And um, I think the exact same thing should be said about your book, which is so erudite and so amazing and traverses so much history. And it, it's like you make a gripping narrative out of it. So um, yeah, so maybe that's what our books have in common. <laughs> I know, I was just thinking like, wow, like that, that maybe what they have in common for sure. Um, I'm going to do also a, a reading of the first chapter of, of my book, Hyphen. Um, before I do, I want to also thank uh, Greenlight Bookstore. I want to thank Bloomsbury, uh, all our wonderful editors. I want to thank Shani, and I want to thank Ayana um, for being in this space with us tonight. It's, it's a real honor, privilege, and pleasure to be here with all of you, so thank you. Every time I said my name in school, I felt caught between two worlds. Did I say my name as it was written in Persian with equal weight between the two syllables, par and dis, as my parents did? Or should I make things easier for my American teachers and classmates who wanted to anglicize my name by focusing either on the last syllable, saying pardis, or just muttering the ugly pardis and erasing the vowels from my name altogether? When I tried to correct people, their non-native Persian speaking brains could not comprehend my pronunciation. So it came that I began introducing myself with the anglicized version of my name, feeling a little pinched each time I do so. My family left Iran in 1978 due to the impending Iranian revolution. But instead of moving to a big city with other migrants and refugees, my parents decided to settle in a suburb outside of Minneapolis, where we, were, where we were among the only brown people the community had ever seen. Rather than try to integrate or assimilate, my parents held fiercely to their Iranianness, insisting on speaking Persian loudly in public and outfitting me in traditional Iranian dress instead of allowing me to venture into denim. The spring and summer of 1985 stand out in my mind as heightened months of liminality. It was an unusually warm spring day for Minneapolis, and my backpack's right strap dug into my shoulder as I swung it around to my front so I could hunt for the small Ziploc baggie of breadcrumbs I had stashed before school. My plan was to convince my mother to let me feed the duck family living on the lake near our house. That's when I knocked into my then four-year-old brother, Paymon, and he screamed loud enough for my mother to turn around from the front seat of our Volvo. She started yelling at me in rapid Persian. What are you doing? Do I need to pull over? Apologize to your brother right now. You're the older sister. Set a better example. Only three years older, I muttered under my breath as I slunk deeper into the folds of the cream-colored leather-lined seats. I looked out the window to be sure no one had heard my mother screaming, not because I was embarrassed about being yelled at, but because I was worried people would hear her speaking in what Minnesotans commonly referred to as that funny language. I was only seven years old in 1985, but I knew the importance of appearance and language. My attempts at coming off as the quintessential American seven-year-old were thwarted regularly by my maternal grandmother who lived with us in Wyzetta. My grandmother refused to learn English and insisted on packing my lunch box full of Persian rice and stews made with aromatic spices like coriander and fenugreek leaves that wafted throughout the cafeteria. As if my name wasn't bad enough, the thick black hair that seemed to grow out of every pore on my body was an additional marker of my otherness. The kids at Woods Academy teased me so badly that on many days I wanted to stay at home in the comfort of my grandmother's lap. On this particular morning, I had begged my parents to let me stay home from school. The kids have gotten meaner somehow, I said in English. My mother flashed me the look, demanding that I switch back to Persian. 
I was stubborn in my desire to acculturate and refused. Only if I caught my grandmother's sad eyes would I acquiesce, not wanting her to be left out. My father bounded down the stairs with my brother clinging to his leg. One hand cradled my brother's hand in his hand, head in his hand, while the other was buttoning his overstarched white Oxford shirt. My mother quickly told him I wanted to stay home from school. Well, did your job, my father said. He then launched into his usual lecture about the importance of education. They can take everything you from everything from you, parties. They can take your home and your belongings. They can even take your country. But the one thing no one can ever take from you is your education. They can never take your mind. My father's whole life revolved around his education. My parents had met in the early 1970s before my father came to the United States in 1972 as a chief res resident at the University of Chicago Medical Center. Americans were eager at the time for well-trained Iranian physicians. And my father, like my two uncles, had been recruited straight from Tehran University Med Medical School after completing his residency in mandatory military service of two years. My father had met my mother only briefly in Iran through her brother, who was at the time my father's roommate. My mother, who attended a French Catholic school in Tehran most of her life, had been accepted to the University of Montreal for her bachelor's degree. Never made it to Montreal. What was supposed to have been a two week stopover in Chicago to help my uncle settle in turned into a four year relationship with my father that ended with them returning to Tehran to marry and start a family. My mother unenrolled from the University of Montreal and learned English by tutoring my uncle's girlfriends in Persian in exchange for English tutoring. She also enrolled at the University of Illinois, Chicago, where she could study industrial engineering. A few weeks after she graduated, she and my father returned to Tehran for what appeared from the faded photographs on our walls to have been a spectacular wedding. My mother was thrilled to be home in Tehran. But this was 1977, and her joy was short-lived as the revolution was already brewing. In July of 1978, my father called Tehran and told my mother that she had been admitted to a school in the United States with a full scholarship. Belly swollen, nationalism deflated, my mother agreed to join him in Minnesota on one condition. My grandmother would come along as well. My father agreed. In August, my mother was eight months pregnant with me and she boarded the last plane that left Tehran for the United States for the next 40 years. It was also the last international flight to depart for some months while the revolution bubbled through the country. This was a story my parents told me weekly. It was the story of their sacrifice, how they lost everything in Iran, but were able to survive in America because of and through their education. Education was the only global currency that could keep you alive. And it was my job to keep earning mine. So on that day in 1985, I pulled on my red and blue outer coat and slung my backpack over my shoulder, getting ready to trudge to school. But that day at school, things were surprisingly calm. No one teased me about my fragrant lunch and during PE, I wasn't even the last one picked for dodgeball. By the afternoon, I was actually glad I had come to school. I sm spotted my mother's blue Volvo and jumped into the car. I then pulled out the baggie of bread breadcrumbs, figuring that if I could get my brother excited about the ducks, we would be certain to have longer at the lake. Came on, grabbed the baggie out of my hands and started shaking it. My mother turned around again, her olive skin flushed red. What are you doing with that? You're going to make a mess. My mother grabbed the breadcrumbs and stuffed them in the car's ashtray. I felt hot tears spring to my eyes because I knew this meant we weren't going to stop at the lake after all. It's okay, Paymon said, using the version of my name, Debbie's, that his three-year-old tongue could manage to produce. Our grandma will walk us there later after mommy goes back to work. Our mother had to return to my father's medical practice where she was in charge of billing and practice management. It wasn't until many years later when I had three children of my own and was trying to run a school that I understood the depth of her fatigue. The exhaustion of her work-life balance was exacerbated by the precarity of our position as Iranians in the United States. She and my father had completed education here and both of her children were American born, but still she kept a suitcase packed in the corner of the house, always ready for departure to return home. She continues to do this to this day. I caught my mother's eyes in the rear view mirror and noticed the purple circles that had deepened there. My tears retreated and I felt a wince of pity for my mom. As we pulled up to the house, she asked if we could get out and walk to the front door so she didn't have to pull into the garage. She was running late again. We walked up closer to the house and I saw a letter posted on the door. As we got closer and closer, I saw each 
angry letter spelling out a message of hate. Burn this house, terrorists live here. I read it out loud to my brother, my voice shaking. What does it mean, he asked, his lips trembling. My fear quickly turned to anger and I started kicking the door. I went to pull the sign down, but the door swung open before I had a chance and I fell forward into my grandmother's arms. Imogen asked what had happened. I pulled out of the hug and took her hand to show her the sign. She couldn't read English. So I read it aloud again, vile coming into my mouth as I spoke the vile words. She stood silently looking at it. It dawned on me that even though she didn't understand the words, she could feel the wickedness just as my brother had. I translated it for her. But before I could even finish, she was running to the phone on our kitchen wall. I dropped my backpack, which felt heavier somehow. Paimon slammed the door shut, willing the words to stay outside and not penetrate in. I heard my grandmother talking to my father, ordering her son-in-law to come home at once. I grabbed my brother's arm and ran downstairs to the basement. As we descended, I heard the television. My grandmother watched Iran Iranian satellite TV all day long, an umbilical cord to the home country that she would never cut even after 40 years of living in the United States. The announcer was speaking in rapid Persian, formal Persian, that I started to understand when my kitchen Farsi ran out. As my brother and I drew closer, we saw the face of Ayatollah Khomeini standing over a crowd that was burning an American flag in celebration. The camera panned to, once, to what was once the US embassy in Tehran, which Khomeini had relabeled the den of spies. Angry people were spray painting graffiti on the walls. My stomach sank. I looked over at my brother who was silently watching. The effects of this day would live with, within us for the rest of our lives. That evening when my father came home from work, the house was unusually silent. From our play area in the basement, Paymon and I heard whispers upstairs and the sound of padded feet pacing the kitchen. When we came up for dinner, my father sat us down and looked at us deeply in the way he had of piercing our souls with his eyes. We're moving to California. It's not safe for us here anymore, he said. My brother and I both nodded, too afraid to say anything or ask any questions. One month later, we did in fact move to Southern California and I spent the rest of my formative years in the safety of a place where more than 1 million Iranians live. For college, I stayed in Southern California, afraid to venture out into the unknown. Still, growing up with hundreds of thousands of other Iranians didn't help my identity crisis. If anything, I grew more and more confused. So why did I write this book? Does a hyphen connect or divide? This has been a central controversy surrounding the important orthographic concept of the hyphen. Even as we focus on whether to hyphenate two words or not, we've forgotten the history, the journey, and the power of the hyphen itself. Hyphen is derived from an ancient Greek word meaning to tie together. Indeed, the origin of the hyphen dates back to the ancient Greek grammarian Dionysus Thrax, deploying this grammatical mark to denote the connection, the bringing together of words before spaces between words became common. This book explores how four hyphenated individuals like myself who feel marginalized in society make belonging by finding power within the hyphen itself. Our journey mirrors the journey of this orthographic concept, moving between foci on the words that the hyphen brings together to focusing on the authority within the hyphen itself. Through self-exploration, we look at the intersections of identity politics, sexual politics, and the politics of belonging. In addition to my story, we meet three other individuals who are all on a similar journey. We watch as they find a way to embrace the space of the hyphen, rejecting the false choice of trying to fit into previously prescribed identities and map our journey through the public sphere. Through these stories, we collectively consider how making belonging as hyphenated Americans serves to fulfill the failures of troubled states, regimes, or institutions and offer possibilities to navigate, articulate, and empower new identities. It's so good. <laughs> it's such a great intro. So vivid in the storytelling, but also, you know, what, what's at stake here, which is like, is it is a uniting factor, a dividing factor? Is it something that can unite multiple different groups of people? I think it, it's just, it's so powerful the way you lay that out, Artis. Thank you. Thank Everyone you. should buy hyphen. Oh no! I'm <laughs> okay. Can you? I, I, I was, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, can you tell us because I loved it and I didn't know the the history of how hyphen came to be as a 
typographical um, entity. Yeah, as an orthograph. Yeah, so that was actually, yeah, so it was actually, the hyphen was actually invented by the ancient Greek grammarian, Dionysus Thrax, who uh, he created the first hyphen, which was actually a U shape, what we would now call a sublinear hyphen. Mm -hmm. um, and he created it so that singers who you would sing the text at the time, people didn't read text, they sung it would know which two words belonged together. And so the hyphen was created to show belonging, um, which I always find so powerful. When we talk about hyphen controversies, we tend to only go as far back as World War II, right? With the you know whole Teddy Roosevelt and Woodrow Wilson saying a hyphenated American is not an American, mm -hmm. but which, which suggests the hyphen as a divider. But when you go back into both Dionysus Thrax and then later Gutenberg, who uses the hyphen to create the Gutenberg Bible, um, we see the hyphen is a signal to create belonging, which I think is what really spoke to me. And you're a historian, you, you, you go way back in there, so you understand this, right? I mean, <laughs> the importance of looking at context, I think, right? Yeah, I, and I think, I, I do think that is something that our books share, that we, we go back quite a long ways to explain what's happening in the current moment and to explain um, issues around identity and, as you say, around belonging or who gets to belong, who doesn't get to belong, who gets to be innocent, who doesn't get to be innocent. Um, and I think, you know, context and rich, rich, deep context matters. Um, so I love that your book goes all the way back to to Thrax and then through Gutenberg and <laughs> it's like it's perfect. Right? Right. Well, and, and this is what I love about your book, right, is that you take you take the history, but you apply it to the present, right? Like you say, look, this is not something we've left behind, right? <laughs> this is something that this is a phenomenon and a deeply disturbing one, by the way, that's being taught in, in classrooms in an elementary school. Yeah. Um, you know, so I was wondering if you wanted to, you know, talk a little bit more about, you know, just how relevant the, the, the historical work that you do is to our moment today. I mean, I can't think of anyone whose work is more relevant to the moment we sit in today than your work. Ah, so no, I, you. I, I, I was thinking maybe you could talk a little bit about kind of what you see, you know, in, in addition to Blackface and how you kind of do that suturing of kind of historical with the present moment through these really powerful stories. Yeah, so I mean, I think in, in blackface, I wrote the book. Um, so I had I had started it, um, I guess, in May of 2020. And in the middle of writing it, George George Floyd was murdered. And I felt so um, I felt like all the emotions that I had about writing about historical amnesia, white innocence, white fragility, and the way that it's tied to an entitlement about who gets to own black performance um, was kind of demonstrated in the most brutal fashion in, in that murder. Um, but I think I, the, the book, everyone loves to think that blackface is in the way back machine, like that's, <laughs> that's and so I just kind of lay out in the first chapter, all the 21st century, 21st century, because we're, we're only in 21 years into the century. and. And I just, it's like everyone that you could think of, right? Like Jimmy Kimmel, Jimmy right. Fallon, Sarah Silverman, 30 Rock, four the episodes. Kelly, right. <laughs> four episodes of 30 Rock with Blackface, Saturday Night Live, um, The Simpsons, Black uh, Family Guy. I mean, like there's so many right in the, and, and, you know, and then there's like, you know, the real housewives or um of new york where violet um, violet delessops is in blackface and so it's just like i just wanted to say it's not in the wayback machine it's right now but we keep forgetting and wanting to pretend that it's something that is over and done with that we don't have to face and address and so i try and trace it all the way back um to its medieval and renaissance um origins like how black characters in both religious plays in the medieval era and then in the first um, secular non-religious plays in the Renaissance era, how black characters were always a white property. It was white men in black prosthetics. Um, and then just tracing that, how it hopped the pond, so. And, and can you say more of, I mean, cause you work on theater today too. And yes. of course, 
can you say, I mean, one of, one of the things people like to think is that like, well, theater is so cutting edge. It's at the cutting edge at the forefront. And, you know, your work also speaks to, you know, you, you look at plays. How do we think about theater today and, and kind of the vestiges and, and how that historical amnesia has played out in both in theater and then, but also in performance that mm -hmm. other people, how other people like to perform kind of what we would call like allyship or that, that, <laughs> that performance, like if you could speak about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think again, right around the murder of George Floyd, the theater, since we were closed during the pandemic anyway, had a real moment of reckoning. And I joked that I suddenly became the most popular <laughs> like theater scholar. <laughs> I was like, I've been screaming this stuff for like, you know, 20 years, like Cassandra, you know, <laughs> no one's like, they're all like, what's this woman screaming about? Oh, I don't know. And then suddenly they're like, oh, you've been writing about race and theater and who gets to perform what, what's acceptable, what's unacceptable, who gets to be a virtuosic actor, who gets to, you know, play other races, who doesn't? These are all the things that I've been thinking and writing about for years. And it is all kind of tied foundationally to this you know, birth of, of blackface. But to pivot to your book, you get to use all your amazing ethnographic, because you're, you're trained as an anthropologist, right? Yes. And mm -hmm. you get to do all this amazing ethnographic work in this book but that tells such a gripping story. Do you want to tell us about your, your four case studies? Yeah, sure. And, and I, and I appreciate that invitation because they're actually all students of mine um, that I've been in contact with. So one is um, an individual who was a student of mine at Pomona college where I spent 12 years of my career. Um, and uh, this individual identifies as Chinese American. And at the start of, the work that I was doing with them, they identified as uh, a queer male Chinese American. Um, and then the book kind of follows their trajectory where they kind of go into a pronoun of they and, and then they actually um, have, a, have a surgery and a sex change and a gender change. And so she now identifies as she, she just now identifies as a Chinese American woman. Um, and I, I, I really, you know, she, she's an important character because I talk about multi hyphen right like we can't you know and that's the whole you know sort of drawing on inspiration of course from Kimberly Crenshaw intersectionality people are multi-hyphenates right we don't have just one identity and so these multi-hyphenate hyphens can be a challenge but they can also bring power and so that was why Danielle's case was really important to me the other students are students of mine from ASU um, one is a star athlete um, who is Nigerian American and kind of exploring his journey who, you know, and his kind of multi-hyphenated identity as, you know, um, African American, but also athlete, right? Like that's a big part of who he is, right? And, and, and kind of his journey with his family. Um, and then finally, we have a, a, a Latinx uh, woman um, who goes through a lot of, you know, sort of trials and tribulations in trying to find herself um, when her mother remarries um, a, a white man and suddenly they're trying to kind of purge all identity from them and how she refines herself in college, but then is kind of challenged by her peers. And so, you know, one of the things that I try to do in the book is show how the hyphen it, you know, the journey of the hyphen, you know, from Dionysus Thrax to today mirrors the journey of hyphenated Americans where there's been this like tension of like, it's to divide, it's to connect. And now it's like, actually it has its own power. It makes something new altogether. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's a creation machine, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, basically. And it, and it makes new words, right? Yes. I mean, you know, email being a classic, right? Bumblebee being another one. So it used to be Bumble space B, then it was Bumble hyphen B, and now it's Bumblebee. And it's the same with email, right? So, so many words. So we think, well, the hyphen is now gone. No, it did its work. It created something new. That's exactly. It's amazing. And I love the way that that um, reads through your book, that you think it could be a tale of people feeling divided or torn. And in fact, you're, you're, you're so optimistic and um, I think very hopeful in this book, which 
um, I needed, <laughs> or, and maybe, maybe we all need right now. Like, I think we need something very hopeful and, and to remind us that we get to create new things. Right. And that new things, as you say, like email is such a good example. Like it's, it's like a new concept. It, yeah. It's a whole new concept. Yeah. Well, and I wrote this book and again, to pivot back to you, I think we both wrote these books during quarantine, yes. during the pandemic. Yes. Right. And so I think I for me, writing this was a part of trying to find belonging. But I wanted to ask you what the experience was like of writing this book in the midst of of not just the pandemic of, of COVID, the viral pandemic, but the social pandemic of yeah. racism, which is so salient and, and really it's just so vibrant throughout your book. What was the experience of the timing of writing the book like for you? I cried a lot when I was writing. I mean, I did feel like it was it was quite cathartic for me because I did feel like I was writing, as you say, to the exact moment. Um, and I felt relief when it was done that I had, I think I've offered something, or I hope I've offered something that will be readable and digestible enough so that we can stop pretending that this has never happened or if it happened, it happened so long ago that it's not relevant. Um, that was really my goal was to make sure that people could say, you know, to their, you know, to the principal at the school, yeah. just, it's only going to take you like an hour to read it. <laughs> Maybe learn something. <laughs> I know, I've, you know. <laughs> I've gifted many copies of Black Faith to many people. I'm like, just, just read it. Just read it. <laughs> just read it. These things are not in the past. I know, we, you know, uh, we like to, there's a lot of, I, I really like that kind of point, you know, you make about historical amnesia. That for me was super salient this year, um, a few weeks ago on the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Yes. Right? And you write about 9-11 in your book so beautifully. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about how it comes up. Yeah, in your book. No, well, I mean, yeah, I, I write about this, this scene where I suddenly felt like, Oh my gosh, being Iranian American, living in New York, I was living in New York on 9-11. I watched the, you know, the towers fall and just this sense of, oh my gosh, now I'm enemy number one. Right. Um, but 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 what I like, you know, again going back to your book, like what I love about your book is it's like, guess what? That, you know, it's been 20 years. That Islamophobia lives with us every day right now. Every day right now. Every day. Um, and and as we look back on let's be honest, the failure of Afghanistan, you know, a failure of US military involvement in Afghanistan, hopefully now we can see yeah. like all of the missteps that we've been making for 20 years and that we're about to continue. So that historical, yep. I really love about your book. Yeah, yeah. And I think, I think you're so right that like um, uh, uh, opening up a space where we can think honestly about our past, whether it's long ago past, fairly recently past, and how that impacts where we're going in the future is so important. And I think that is precisely what unites our books, right? Like that we're saying like, here's some, here's some history, here's some stories about right now, what are we gonna do with this as we go forward, right? Like what kind of new thing, what kind of hyphen do we wanna create going forward, right? Uh, what, and what kind of world do we wanna, like how do we use this information and like this reminder really yeah. to say okay what kind of transformation do we want to see yeah yeah uh, should we, we should open it up yeah uh, yeah shani do you, you want to come back <laughs> everyone Hi. um let's see if you have any questions please put them in the q a module um we're waiting yeah uh, we're waiting <laughs> we, we didn't look to see if there were any questions all right i just i saw the chat like scrolling and i thought oh there must be questions but i, didn't, I didn't closely enough obviously yeah i'm sure people have questions let's remind them in the chat as well um and Y'all can just keep on going if you'd like until I know some. Okay. That's all right. I'll, I'll, I'll ask Ayana. So our <laughs> listeners might not know, Ayana and I both have daughters of a similar age and they're friends. And I remember one of the first times we got together, they wanted to perform Hamilton. Yeah. Um, I'll never forget that. Um, but I, I guess I just wondered, I mean, of course, you probably get this question a lot, but what do you make of it? What do you make of Hamilton, given the kind of flipping of the script? You know, what what do you make of it? Um, well, I think 
so one thing that's interesting about Hamilton is that people assume it was cast in a colorblind fashion, that is without regard to the races of the actors and, and you know, what their bodies are doing on stage, but actually it was very, very intentional. And in the script, it says what race each actor should be who's playing a specific part. So when they have tour versions and when they have, um, yeah, primarily tour versions or versions that go to other cities, it's very scripted about what races of actors will be cast. So it's, that's a kind of intentional casting. Um, but I think that is um, often misread by audiences. So I think that misreading is really interesting. Yes. Um, <laughs> and then I also am interested in some of the recent critiques of, of, of it, um, particularly by Ishmael Reed, who wrote a response play called The Haunting of Lin-Manuel Miranda, which yes. is like <laughs> Miranda like taking a nap and George Washington coming <laughs> and speaking to him. And 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 it's and Hamilton coming and speaking to him and saying, you know, I, I had slaves, right? <laughs> so so I think there's like there's an interesting way that figures tied to the Black Arts movement um, have a different reaction to Hamilton than I think a lot of the white mainstream um, Broadway um, theater goers do. So uh, so I think it's it's complicated and interesting and but. I love anything like that that allows us to have a richer conversation. Yeah, no, I mean, and then that's what I was saying as you were talking about like plays then and now I'm like, what I like about it is it kind of flips the script and but it, but it gets you thinking and it gets you questioning. Um, so I, I just wondered about that. And I have another question for you so I haven't seen any, which is what has been the reaction to your book? I mean, because I, I, I know the reaction to my, like when people write me and their different reactions, what what has been the reaction to to your book? Have people like been like, oh, yes, like like when I read, I was like, of course, like of course, right? <laughs> it's been but, yeah, it's been really um, gratifying that people have and and I think a lot of um, white bloggers have been like, this is the this is the best read because it's like so clear and I, I get I understand a topic that I never thought I could understand. So I find that very. Um, that makes me happy because I was thinking about them. Like if you if you have a PhD in you know theater race and theater history, this is not the book for you because you already know it. But <laughs> maybe you don't know the whole history. But um, but like I think it's for the the lay reader. So um, yeah. that's yeah. what object lessons seems to do really well. So I, yeah. I think you know just a little plug for the whole series. I that's think great. they they really do this. They've really nailed this um, art of of producing books that have a like that leave you with like a really strong understanding of a subject matter that maybe you didn't think about but they're presented in this beautiful accessible way yeah, um, yeah. you know I, I yeah I, and it's it's so funny because academics we often think we're writing in an accessible way and it's not accessible at all and you know this because you were a journalist like it's a different it's a very different style of writing and thinking um and with a different audience in mind so and how about you? What's the reaction been to yours? Um, it's also made me very happy. I've had a lot of people write to me and say, I never knew how to describe it, but I love being able to describe myself as a, as a hyphenate who's embracing the hyphen. And I'm like, yeah. great, that, that, that's great. Um, I also was surprised there is a very large group of um, uh, grammar files um, who are like really into like, uh, you know, all things orthographic and and so I've been on a lot of like language uh, uh, podcasts and like grammar podcasts and That's talking so cool. to people about like grammar and, you know, and it's led me down a path of like, well, who invented the semicolon and why and like all these things about like power and language, which kind of was in my anthropology degree like way back when, but it has brought me, it's kind of reconnected me with a side of my discipline that I hadn't connected with so the the grammar piece of it um that was really interesting to me is it, just learning about um the the history of the orthography that has really uh been transformative for me um, and it's so great when you have that opportunity when you're like you, you get to expand what you're thinking about because you're touching on one piece and then you realize these people love it 
And now I get to learn from them as well. <laughs> yes, yes, no, I agree. And, and, and then, you know, you've got a lot of, I know probably lots of New Yorkers are with us tonight, but all the people who are like, yeah, I knew it was new hyphen York. I knew there was <laughs> hyphen in New York. Um, and so I've, I've gotten a lot of New Yorkers writing and saying, bring back the hyphen. I'm, like, I'm, I'm with you. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny, like the when, like who decides when the hyphen disappears and and it just becomes the new word. Like when did the hyphen disappear in email? Right. And so 2006 is when it disappeared. It's not wild. And, we can actually track it. And did and was it just a dictionary? Like is it the Oxford English Dictionary yeah. or which one? Yeah. Yeah. Shorter shorter Oxford English Dictionary. They're the ones you decide. Yeah. Wow. So they could bring the hyphen back for New York. They could bring it back for New York. I think they should start a campaign. No. They, they also, though, you know, to their credit, they also introduced the hyphen in new words. So, you know, that that's a people accuse them of being hyphen thieves. I remember there was this whole thing about a hyphen thief. This is the Oxford English dictionaries are hyphen thieves. And it's like, actually, yeah, they take it out, but then they put new hyphens. In. Yeah. Is ever a language ever evolving. amazing amazing <laughs> well shani do we have any any do we get any questions we don't have any questions i think y'all are answering a lot as you're going along to be honest i know i had most of my questions answered <laughs> um, uh, asking about new york i did not know that it was hyphenated <laughs> yes and actually if you go to the new york historical society it's written in stone because that's when it was first built the building actually carved in stone and the hyphen is still there they're like well it's carved in stone we're not taking it out um so <laughs> go, go visit the new york historical society for sure was new jersey hyphened too oh my gosh Ooh. and the new york times the new york times was written new hyphen new york times i did not know that <laughs> not wild <laughs> fun fact um well so when did the new york times drop the hyphen In they dropped it right master. around when there was the anti-hyphenism the whole member john wayne had that song and this whole a hyphenated american is not an american mm -hmm. um right around world war ii that's when everybody dropped it wow wow amazing <laughs> all right well Sounds like you answered everybody's questions. Well, good. We don't want to give away too much. You got to go <laughs> buy the book. Go buy them. Go buy them. <laughs> we do have one question. Um, okay. It's from Rachel Moore uh, asking, since writing these books, is there anything you would want to add or include or anything that you find fascinating that didn't make the final manuscript? So want to go first? You should go first, Pardis. Um, I guess I would have wanted to add a little bit more about this year. And um, like I said, the anniversary of 9-11 and kind of um, the challenges that a lot of hyphenated folks in my community have had um, with grieving that. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and then also like thinking about when people change identities, I wanted to go a little bit further when people change identities and how that hyphen like how you do have to sometimes grieve, grieve the loss of that, I think. Mm -hmm. And I've been, and I think it will probably end up being a, a book, <laughs> but I've been thinking a lot about um, Black actors and who gets to be considered a virtuosic actor and how that's tied to not only the, the race of the actor, but what races they're allowed to play and that kind of shape shifting who gets to be shape shifting so i think that's probably an idea that sparked out of this book that will be i think probably an, another big book and maybe i'll do it as a trade book so stay stay around there blooms yeah I, I i'm actually doing a trade book that that um it was inspired by the writing of this book but it's it's a it's a memoir um oh my gosh congratulations so, yeah yeah so stay tuned Great. <laughs> oh, very cool. Uh, thank you for that. Um, and it's 8.20, so we'll wrap it up. Um, it's Patty's birthday, so we're wishing her a happy birthday. Thank you. Thank you so much. What a great way to spend my birthday with you all. Thank you. Yeah, hopefully you get to celebrate and enjoy some good food after this. 
uh, happy birthday. And we'll wrap it up. Make sure to buy the books, um, either in person or online. Thank you so much for being here with us. Go um, to Greenlight and buy the books. <laughs> place to be. Um, let me put in one more time the links and then we'll let everyone go. Um, thank you both for being here. Thanks Thank so much, Shani. Thanks, Greenlight. Happy birthday parties. Thank you. Thanks so much, Ayana. Thanks, Shani. Thanks, Greenlight. Thanks, Kathy, for bringing us together. Thanks, everyone. <laughs> Thank you.